Senegal. <laughs> so that's already some interesting uh, points to, to mention, but you have the floor, Camille. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and uh, welcome, everybody. I'm really pleased to, to meet you today. Uh, my name is Camille Gallier. I work with Open Briefing, a UK-based organization specialized in uh, holistic security approaches. We are a remote-based organization, and we mostly work with human rights defenders, environmental rights defenders, and organizations that are also working on campaigns. Uh, so I, I see a lot of uh, similarities with, um, with your organizational uh, backgrounds. So I'm really pleased to meet you today for this topic on um, leadership in crisis. Um, we are also a team, as Anna was mentioning, working um, on, on security and digital security and well-being as a holistic approach to, um, to, sec to security and safety. And to, in today's topic, we're going to uh, look more in, in depth to um, crisis and uh, how leadership works during crisis, what could be done um, to prepare your, your own leadership to a crisis. Um, so starting, for starters, um, just a quick look at the agenda. Um, and so we will have a look at the definition of crisis and crisis management versus crisis leadership. We will also look into what um, are the essential skills uh, for leadership during, before and after a crisis. And um, there will be also time for um, practice and some exercises around uh, leadership tools, such as coaching uh, and uh, an introduction to somatic coaching, which is um, coaching through your um, listening to your body. Um, before I go into the details of, of this presentation today, just a, a quick reminder in terms of how we will work on the, on the webinar. So feel free to interrupt me during the session and ask questions as we go. Um, and uh, if you want to react, you can also use the chat. There will be time as well for exercises and we will be uh, in breakout rooms a bit later during the, the webinar. So it will be quite interactive so that you can put already in practice what we are discussing today. So for starters, what, what is a crisis? Uh, how would you define a crisis? If, if I can have a, one or two ideas from, from you already, what, what is a crisis for you? I think it, it's a, it can be like a conflict situation. It's an incredibly massive distraction that is unwanted it, it doesn't go to plan it involves uh, potential danger and harm to the organization whether it's physical digital or a slap lawsuit and so what you were doing yesterday which was trying to move the organization forward according to plan that all gets sidelined because you've got a crisis so not an overly pleasant thing to have happen Thank you. Exactly, it's dramatic. So you have brought a different different types of concept into a crisis, into the the word crisis, and so dramatic change or a harm to an organization is indeed a, um, a definition for a crisis. That of course, crises have no borders or, or boundaries, and they they are brought both by surprise and they bring also dramatic change to an organization. Um, etymologically, crisis comes from the Greek, which means to sift or separate. So it has the potential to really divide an organization's uh, past from its future or security and replace it with insecurity. And so um, at Open Briefing, we came up with this definition that is quite close to what you, you both um, mentioned, which is uh, an unexpected event or situation and that has a potential uh, to cause critical harm to either your uh, people, your reputation, organizational finance systems, or the entire or organization, and that therefore requires an additional leadership and coordination um, resource focus that is outside of the normal uh, management line. In order to be considered as a crisis, it must be um, it must imperil an organization objectives or goals. Um, and uh, it is important as well as 
you are leaders in your organization to bring your own definition of a crisis. Because the way you see a, a crisis will define how you will be able to answer it as well. So how you will define it will predict and dictate uh, how you see the world and how you will be able to understand the crisis and to respond to it. So it is interesting as to start with the definition because already when we uh, as an organization don't necessarily have an, a definition of a crisis, um, that's where actually our plan uh, can already derail. Um, so in some crises are the combination of um, unusual events and shared perceptions uh, that something is seriously wrong. Oops, yeah. So here are a few examples of um, what a crisis could be from death, major injury or kidnap, um, long-term detention of, our, of your people, can be safeguarding issues when we have, for instance, uh, uh, sexual harassment or, um, or sexual abuses stories going to the press about your organization. It can be also major operational disruption, uh, loss in finance, um, et, cetera, et cetera. Of course, we can think of um, other events like terrorist attacks or natural disasters. Uh, and probably you have a few more examples that you've uh, been through already or that you have in mind. And as, as from this list, you can see that the scope and severity can vary greatly. Many of the listed item, items here are events that occur outside of the organizations. Um, but also there are some events that can be inside an organization. And so a crisis is not necessarily an external event. It can come also from within. So it's important to notice that uh, many organizations as well do not have a list of what constitutes a crisis. So it's a bit linked to the, your own definition of a crisis. And by having a list of events describing what constitute a crisis, the organization will be much quicker to recognize when a crisis hits and to respond to, be, to, to the crisis. So the organization will be less likely to overreact when there are less severe events. Uh, so sometimes we take, uh, I, I don't know, um, conflict in an organization as a crisis. It might be disrupting your uh, organization to, to what level is it? Is it really a crisis? And does it need to enter the crisis uh, cycle? That's a question that leaders uh, and organization should, be, should ask themselves. So when we speak about crisis management, usually we immediately think about risk assessments, um, mitigation measures, planning uh, planning phases and a summarized way to look at crisis management is this crisis cycle when the leadership activates the crisis then there is the first hour well usually it's allocated to gather data and then will the, the crisis team will meet and uh, start to respond to the to the crisis here it's the longer phase in the response where you have uh, people going to do their work, then you come back to meet again, except and back and forth until the, the crisis um, is closed and then you enter a learning phase. Um, when we will look at um, crisis leadership in a minute, it's important to, to remember that plans are nothing, but the planning is everything meaning that when it comes to leadership, it's more the planning process in itself that will serve you than the plan in itself. Why? Because the plans are made, um, th that are made maybe not actually implemented perfectly due to the varying circumstances of the crisis. The, the planning in itself is important because then you explore all the variables and possible responses. And that's where you can see how your team is flexible to react and to respond to a crisis. And this benefits from the planning process is why a plan should never be put 
on the shelf for years. It, it needs to be revisited uh, on a regular basis. An organization usually will have um, crisis management plan, an, activity, an activation process, uh, crisis management structure with the roles and responsibilities, as well as relevant policies and procedures. So in your planning process, in your crisis management process, you will possibly identify who will be in the first hour, the person who will be sent for data collection, who is our, uh, who are the members of our crisis management team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, when we come to crisis leadership, first, why should we think about crisis leadership? Why, why is it important for you? Why, why are you here today? I'm asking it uh, uh, to the audience if, if I may have a few feedback on that question. Why is it important? I think because um, the sector that we work in, it's not uncommon um, for crisis and for the sectors because we're quite diverse, but also um, because it's important to consider what you might do as a leader in a situation that comes up that is least expected. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Joel, you wanted to, to also react? I saw your mic open. Yeah, I was just thinking, I've worked in all the different sectors or at least most of them and a crisis has happened at least once in every organization uh, that I've worked at. And there are times where I was either assisting the leadership team or part of the leadership team that managed that crisis. So I think from that perspective, it's not uh, if a crisis happens, it's when a crisis happens. And, you know, why is crisis leadership so important? You want to be able to get through that crisis as well as humanly possible. And I think leadership, not only in the context of crisis, but in managing the organisation across all areas, uh, leadership is just so key. Um, it, it will determine to a large extent how well we cope with things, including crises. So I don't know, that was, that was some of the things that were swimming around in my mind as you asked the question. Thank you. Thank you both, Alex and, and Joel. And indeed, as you say, resilience and how the, the organization will cope, and how will it be after the crisis? Um, today, it's more and more important for leaders to be equipped with the right leadership crisis skills because we are also seeing a shift in the nature of crisis. Um, natural disasters have occurred since time began. Uh, they've always affected humans. But what we are witnessing today is uh, more and more crises are not necessarily related to natural um, causes. They are, uh, we can see like large scale uh, factory accident, uh, corporate crime or mismanagement. So more and more crises are human uh, and are a human element. And therefore, in today's world, it, crisis um, leadership is more important than, than the past. And we need crisis leaders who are prepared for crisis as a way of life in also um, leading organizations. So the difference between crisis management and crisis leadership is in this human element. When crisis management relates more to operational issues, crisis leadership will deal principally with how leaders handle the human response to a crisis. And that's why it takes also more time and learning to develop those skills than for crisis management that is more straightforward. So if we can propose a definition for what crisis leadership is, it's all about the ability of a leader to influence others to get results. And as such, crisis leadership is all about the human side. Leaders will need to take a look at the human elements like emotions, behaviors, the reactions that affect and are affected by the crisis and can influence its outcome. And it's working with that view of being aware of how people can possibly react or behave and how this reaction might actually 
be um, an opportunity to respond to the crisis or endanger uh, the crisis itself. And that's where actually it's really critical when you're setting your response team, your crisis response team. In your plan, in your crisis management plan, you can either, you have identified roles already and possibly you have assigned people. When the crisis hits, if you don't know already what is the emotional management of that individual and how they react under high level of stress, that might be a, a risk for your, your uh, cri for leading your crisis as well, because someone who is under high level of stress might show different behaviors and therefore might not be in the best position to have the role, for instance, for media relation or family liaison. And usually uh, when we, we look at those, those roles, they are automatically assigned, like family liaison, it's going to be HR, or um, I don't know, um, the crisis lead, it's going to be the CEO. Not necessarily are those people the best person during the crisis to be, in, to be at, those respons at those roles. So it's important for you as a leader to actually have a good mapping of your, your employees in terms of emotional intelligence, behaviors, and uh, reactions in the, under uh, stress. And stress is indeed um, caused by three major sources during a crisis. The event in itself, the job that you're asking the person to, to do, and the way the organization function. And those are the three leverage where you as a leader will need to have a look. So what is stressful about this event and how can I uh, mitigate that for, for my staff? What am I asking to the person and is he able to deliver it? So at each stage of the crisis cycle that you've seen earlier, it's an important question to remind yourself to look at the signs for distress also in, in people. Are they in the right place to keep doing the job? Usually you cannot uh, deliver a job under high level of pressure for a long time. So that's why there is a rotation in your in your staff in the crisis response. And here you have an example of where we are in terms of level of stress. In, in times of crisis, you are more on the strain side. So it's important that you as a leader can identify signs so that the people don't go into the red zone, which is more burnout or even uh, can be traumatic for, for the people responding to the crisis that are uh, subject to, for instance, vicarious trauma. Um, as such, uh, the more trust as a leader you have within your team, the less there will be cr stress uh, and crisis uh, fatigue within your staff members. And so the, a, a few tips for, for you as leaders, and sometimes it's common sense, but common sense is not necessarily common practice, um, is first set the good example and take care of yourself. Show the example that it's important to, to be aware of the, the emotional limits as well in responding in a crisis. Learn how to handle stress and high level of, of stress and lead a, a balanced life. Another element, especially true in crisis, is think today, because today is the time for action. Even if when you're looking in the future, what the potential impact will be of the crisis, the opportunities, et cetera. It's only in the present time that you can actually put the action. So think today rather than in, in a month time, in, in two, two months time. Get more sleep and use positive self-talk. Those are a few things that could be easily put in place for you as leaders, and that will definitely have an impact when the crisis hits. So it's a day-to-day -day practice to start now already. Now, when we think of successful crisis leaders, I've put here uh, two pictures, and of course, one may relate or, or not to, to, those, to those leaders. But the, the most interest um, that, I, that I have in this is more the question mark for you. So I would like to ask you uh, and to guide you through a quick exercise and think of a successful leader. Who do you identify as a successful leader? So just uh, take a few seconds. It can be someone 
uh, very famous. It can be in your family, can be in your team already, can be yourself. Think of someone who you consider as a successful crisis leader. And when you have it in mind, do you have it all uh, an example? Yeah? Can I see nods or yeah? Okay. <laughs> right. So I'm going to ask you to uh, visualize as if you could see this person in, in front of you. And I'm going to do the exercise with you. It's going to be a, visually, a visual exercise. So if you want, you can close your eyes. I usually do it uh, when I close my eyes. But you can keep your eyes open or turn the video off if you prefer. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and visualize in front of you Dutch crisis leader. And take a few minutes to observe how this person behaves, how this person moves, how do they move their body, what do you hear them say. Pay attention for one minute. Maybe you can also see how the impact of such a behavior is on others, what they uh, their main emotional mood is. And when we are connected with this, just write down the, the keywords that you've noticed. How was this individual moving, behaving? What was his mood or her mood? How was her posture or his posture? And once you've done that, you're gonna go back to this visual exercise and see the leader in front of you, where you're gonna come closer to, her, to him or to her. And at some point, you're gonna be at his or her place. You're gonna be him or it's going to take his feet, his knees, arms, and be yourself in front of the other people you see in the scene. And just put yourself in his shoes or her shoes and see how it feels. What body posture? she or he is using and notice how it feels for you. Take one minute to just embody this posture and then slowly come back. You can open your eyes again. And notice what was different. You can write down uh, what came up for you. What were you able to do from this posture or to say or to think? And now I would like to ask you, what would you say are the main leadership um, skills or, or, or role that you saw from, from this experience? What came up? What was the most important for a leader, a successful leader to do or to be or to, to think? Anything that came up that you thought was an important thing to notice in terms of how a leader should behave. I'm just sort of revisiting all the words I've written down here. And I think the, the third word was empathetic. So, you know, there was serious and doesn't take herself too seriously, empathetic, great listening. Um, that all led to being able to get most people motivated to move uh, in the direction that she was advocating. Empathy. Julia? Um, actually, I uh, had a slightly different word, but I think it goes in the same um, line, but I think it's important to draw the, the distinction. I actually wrote compassion, grace, and calm. And I think it's important to understand the difference between compassion and empathy, because when you're empathetic, you take the other person or the situation's pain and you make it your own. So I think then it's a lot more difficult to stay calm and clear. And um, it sort of, it also makes it more about you, which makes you um, less capable to, um, 
to react to the situation, um, to manage the situation as opposed to react to the situation, perhaps. Um, but I, but I think that it's key that you understand what the other person is feeling or putting yourself in someone else's shoes, be it your team, be it the person that is suffering the, that is at the um, heart of the crisis, perhaps. Um, yeah, those, are, those were the words that I. Thank you. So it goes in the in the same uh, direction, indeed. Any other elements? No, I see that Alex put in the chat that uh, they were calm. This person, this leader, was uh, calm. Calm, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, indeed, there there are three main roles that a leaders um, should keep in mind when when leading a, a crisis. And you have identified one around uh, caring, what you call compassion, empathy, caring, uh, and um, communication is more towards being calm, how you, how you show up as well. Clear vision and value. So why caring? Caring, because as I was explaining earlier, leadership in crisis is all about the human side. And therefore, relationships really lies at the heart, at the heart of, of leadership. And because crises are fraught with emotions, um, leaders who are highly skilled in emotional intelligence have a significant advantage during a crisis when it comes to influencing others or to get results. And common emotions that uh, arise in crisis can go from um, fear, anger, uh, anxiety, to shock, sorrow, disgust. It could be also love uh, when, when you are into the response uh, and, and really care for the people you're trying to, to help. Um, can be desire for revenge. So there are a flow of emotions that are happening during crisis and, and developing your emotional intelligence will really help you as a leader. To face, uh, to face it with your, with your team. Some basic also human needs during the crisis are around attention, participation, acceptance, nurturing, and therefore caring will be important to have this compassion, the, the empathy as well. And there's an opportunity to grow and, and to achieve as well. For communication, um, it's important because crises have the tendency to bring a high degree of chaos and confusion in, in organizations. And therefore, um, if there is a lack of information precisely at a moment where everyone is in need uh, for um, information and, and uh, has a new, huge emotional need for it, then th there will be uh, a problem in, in the way your team is able to, to respond to it. So information, particularly from um, someone in leadership po position is really important and includes different ways of communicating. Not only external communication, but as you were mentioning, mentioning the way you appear as a leader. It includes clear and articulate verbal expression that considers the tone of voice, um, the choice of the words that you will use, the tempo of your speech, um, the appropriate body language as well, eye contact, um, some responsive gestures as well, such as uh, saying, okay, sure. That's, that's really uh, reassuring. And um, it's also important to notice that leaders should direct communication to all levels of the organization, not, not just their highest or, or direct reports, but really to, to all uh, levels of the organization. And sharing information is not a, a one-time event. It should be a regular, pra a regular practice, not only during a crisis. It will become more critical even in, in crisis times. And therefore, the, the, the three R's can be applied here. Review, repeat, reinforce your, your message. With regards to clarity of uh, vision and values, leaders can really leverage a credible um, vision and value system and use both as rallying point during a crisis. 
it has um, a crisis as a tendency to distend people from the job that has to be done. And that's why it's even more critical to the survival of the organization to have a discourse and um, a uh, an operating system that's really links to the organizational vision and values. So in practice, what does it mean? For instance, in communication, you will um, there are different steps that you might include, such as writing a formal press release, um, taking the initiative, don't wait for the, the press to, to leak some information, um, apologize if, if necessary, and explain fully and clearly uh, what is happening. Evaluate, evaluate also what you communicate, how you communicate, and monitor your, your media. For what you called compassion or empathy, it's important that it comes from a sincere perspective uh, because that can be really damaging if you try to do it and you're not naturally um, at ease with it, it's preferable not to do it because it can be seen as not at authentic and it can completely uh, go in the opposite direction that what you're looking at. Relationships are something that are built in the long term and maintained over the long term. So it's not because there is a crisis that suddenly I'm going to be interested in, in how people are and, and, and what's going on in their life. It's something that needs to be a, a common practice in your, in your leadership. Um, sharing your experience um, is also a way to strengthen relationships. Um, and it's important to have an eye on potential conflicts and to, to solve them, not, not to let them um, as it is and, and minimize them. And in terms of the values and, and vision, as said previously, set the example, behave along your values, take responsibility as well. Uh, even if, uh, for instance, there, there is a, um, a crisis is at, is at uh, an organizational level, it, it is internal, take responsibility and, and activate uh, the, the response to the crisis and be visible. Um, people need to see the leader, people need to hear from, from you during crisis. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important to, uh, to don't, don't necessarily delegate all the communication uh, because you will need to be seen to reinforce trust and, uh, and safety as well for, for the team. So when we look at what are the skills needed um, based on the crisis management cycle that you've seen earlier, when we are in the activate phase, some uh, errors that, that can be made that have been made in the past by organizations are usually we automatically appoint the CEO as the crisis management team leader. And it's not necessarily the best um, person to, to be at that, in, in that role. Why? Because if the leader has not already developed the three different elements that I've mentioned earlier, then uh, there might be um, difficulties actually to lead the crisis efficiently. What you need here in this, in this phase as leadership skills is stability. So you need to be um, aware of who is the best person to be in different roles of the crisis and take also the responsibility to say, if you as the leader, as the CEO, um, feel that you are the best person to be the, the crisis lead as well. Uh, there is a need to inform and communicate at this time. So the posture here, we're gonna speak about uh, embodied leadership. You, that is what you've experienced a bit earlier with this quick exercise. So to embody your leadership here, you need stability in the way you're gonna inform, communicate, gonna have a calm uh, presence. Then the first hour is when usually uh, one of the errors that, that could be made is to take immediate decision based, based on initial reports. Initial reports usually have the tendency to um, over um, to exaggerate sometimes the facts 
so it's really important that the first hour is allocated to uh, data collection and identify a trustful individual that will do that and lead that. And then you can take a decision on how to, um, to organize and, and set up the team. First meeting, it's, it's linked to, to the activate, hour, activate uh, phase as well. There, um, the, the, the crisis management team um, gathers together. And here, your leadership skills needed is around clear communication. So having the facts right will help you have to have clear communication and role distribution. In the response phase, that is the longest phase for, for the crisis management. Here, what you need to watch out is that usually individuals are pushing their limits and they don't know when to say, I'm not the best person to do the job anymore. I'm not able to interact with the family. It's going, uh, I'm already, I'm starting to be traumatized by it. Or um, it's even your, your security team sometimes is uh, uh, the ones that, that might be um, the first responders that can be also uh, uh, trustful partners to, to, to the individual who they are trying to help. And therefore, it's not only the security role that they have, sometimes they have uh, a well-being role as well. Um, so it's important that you assess uh, and check in with, with the team members. How are they currently doing? Are they still able to do the job? Even if they say yes, it is your call to, to have a look at will their behaviors endanger the impact and the outcome of the, of the crisis? And therefore here, the leadership skills that is needed is the caring for individual. You will need also to have, to have communication in the sense to be more decisive. The decisiveness will be important. Uh, even if you're caring for individuals, not because they say, yes, I can carry on, that they, they are. And that's when you need to, to draw the line as well. Therefore here, it's where emotional intelligence skills are the, the best use and it will be the most uh, important for you to, to have. During the, the closing of the crisis, what we see the tendency is to continue the crisis management once the crisis has ended. Hence the need for a definition and the need for clear identification of what constitutes a crisis. Because if you don't have that from the beginning and you just start doing um, uh, mitigation plans already, then you, you will keep um, be, work in a crisis mode and never and it will never end. So this might be lack, due to a lack of clarity about uh, what constitutes a crisis, but also around your vision and most likely largely your values. So here your leadership skills that are needed is to be really grounded into your organizational values and your vision. And then the last phase around learning. And one uh, limit that we've seen in, in this phase is that um, individuals might focus more on the mechanics of the crisis, meaning the management of the crisis and not looking at um, opportunities to reflect on at deeper levels about organizational changes that are needed. For instance, sometimes a crisis might need, we need to review our values. If we take the example of, um, I've seen you, Julia, I'm just uh, finishing the sentence, I'll, I'll give you the, the floor. Um, if you take the example of uh, one famous organization that has been uh, in the news for sexual abuse uh, in the Haiti response, there were many organizations. And, and that has lasted until actually last year. Uh, the impact of the crisis was really, really serious and damages completely the relation to the donors. Um, and uh, it took time to them to reflect and, and, and to realize the need is to really review our values and how we communicate on the values and what it means in practice and the behaviors that we see. And that took them so much time that for um, five years, they were banned three years from any donors, um, UK grants. 
and even now uh, they, they are facing some some difficulties so it's it can be uh, very important at this learning stage as well to to put in place the right um, um and, and courageous uh, decisions and there you will need openness openness to review your values to review your procedures yes julia I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on uh, close uh, phase, because I can imagine situations that, um, I don't know if that's to do with how you've planned for the crisis or define the crisis probably, but like that the event that you consider as a crisis arises, but it may, the event itself may not have a, an end. Um, so for example, um, the thing that came to mind was, let's say one of our, uh, colleagues start getting threats, for example, that may not end. So that may be something that triggered sort of the crisis because it's not something that has happened before and it's something we've defined as a crisis. We may have a response plan, but that doesn't mean, you know, it's not like in five days, the threats are necessarily going to end. They might, but they may also just continue. And it just means that this person's profile, for example, has risen or um, their uh, uh, risk profile has risen. So. I was wondering how that um, mm. relates. Thank you, Julia. It's very similar as well in organization that leads in a context where they are under a constant risk, like uh, in, um, in DRC, for instance, or in other contexts where actually the risk is always around you. And in that, in that context, you are, you, are, uh, you are not necessarily enter, entering the crisis cycle because it's part of your daily management. So the difference will be if it comes a daily management, then you're not entering into the crisis. It's really when it's uh, disrupting your entire organizational system. So that's why you need to be clear on your vision and how you define a crisis. Because when you go back to the definition, it's really uh, an event that is um, unexpected and that can disrupt your organizations, your, um, your finances, uh, individual's life if it's uh, repeated then it's more in terms of daily management that you will have plans in place around uh, mitigation security mitigation measures to ensure that uh, if they move from point a to point b there is a convoy or uh, or uh, you you ensure that they um, they are not authorized to go in the zone if you've heard uh, that their risk has increased. So it's more uh, uh, a regular management. But of course, this cycle phase can be 24 hours. It can be one year. It can be two years. It's really up to the organization to then define, OK, when do we say it's a start? When we do we say it's, a, it's an end? Joel? Yeah, I was just thinking of an example uh, that might help with Julia's question. Uh, before joining the CCCA, I worked uh, for an organization that had um, most of its work done in the office. So, of course, the pandemic was a big disruption to that. And like many organizations around the world, we set up a crisis management team because the disruption was so significant. And, you know, the pandemic is still with us. And yet that organization's crisis management team doesn't exist anymore. So how did they close the crisis management team down? Well, I think it was linked to the learning. You know, we learned to bring in new IT tools. We learned to use them. We automated a lot of processes. You know, we learned to do our work differently. And because of that, we then closed the crisis management team down, even though the pandemic was still there and it became a new way of working. Not dissimilar to this idea that you have to revise your values, for example, uh, in a mm. different context, like the one you gave with uh, with Haiti. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joel. Very, very uh, useful indeed. The, does it um, answer your question, Julia? Yeah? All right. So why now coaching could help during uh, a crisis, before, during, and after a crisis? What, uh, First, because coaching is a, is a powerful approach to help you as a leader hold all this. And crisis leadership is all about relationships. So understanding how uh, you can help others navigate their emotions and, and behaviors so that they have the appropriate response to what the crisis needs. needs. Um, 
you need to start with yourself. So understanding your own emotions, how to build um, emotional intelligence, increase your empathy, your caring, uh, will help you in your ability to relate to others. And um, maybe I'm tempted here to, to just quickly uh, do a tour in, in the room and how do you, how do you um, how do you build your emotional intelligence? Do you have tips already of how you do it? I think the first thing for me personally was becoming aware that emotional intelligence existed and you know mm -hmm. what it comprised of. You know that awareness model was oh because after the awareness, like oh well, how does that apply to me? And then you start you know critiquing yourself upon occasion. You know you reflect, well, did I really? Yeah, I hadn't had much sleep. I was impatient with, you know, the 10 year old son who's very argumentative. Um, would I have necessarily uh, reacted that way if I wasn't sleep deprived? You know, you start examining your, your emotional reactions and, and how they get triggered. So I think uh, becoming aware of it and then reflecting and looking to mm -hmm. adjust um, kind of helps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Years of work with a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. That helps as well, yeah. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, mostly it's like by watching other people who lead situations really effectively and learning. I mean, that's one way of doing it as well, just to kind of watch people who are really effective during these situations. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you're, you're mobilizing, mobilizing your, your skills to uh, repeat, so to observe and repeat. I sound like a psychopath, don't I? Like just trying to learn from other people, modeling their behavior. It's not so much that. I just no, it's know. actually a, a technique that is used in uh, neuroscience to model others when you want to. Um, is, it, is it really? To, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good, very good technique as well. And it's already what it's actually the technique that we've used earlier in when we were asking to think of a leader, modeling yeah, the, the leader. I had Vladimir Putin in my head. Is that okay? <laughs> Me too. I was it's just like, to, it's up to you. <laughs> he would take his shirt off and get on a horse, and that would be amazing. James, I, it, I thought I might be really offensive, so I just kept it to myself. But now it's out. No, yeah, no, it's fine, James. We still love you. That's fine. <laughs> you know um, what's really cool no. about him, though, and I, I'm not suggesting that I do like dictators. Um, Although I've just said I'm probably psyched about as well, like the 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 kind of the fact that he seems to enjoy a crisis as well. <laughs> I think that's something, right? That, that's what I was about to 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 react. Actually, it's what in this leader do you see is um, uh, critical skills is actually what you need to um, to focus on. I, I think uh, depending on who he is and and what he does, but he has some if it showed to you it's if he came up it's just that there is something in his leadership that you you can relate or you 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 think is uh, relevant so i i think partially it's um the I, I think basically in the work that most of us do you just you accept that a crisis isn't something that you basically know that crises are going to happen and I think that's a really critical thing. People are always really shocked when there's a crisis. But I think if you go into it in the mindset that like, you know crisis is going to happen and basically is part of the work you do, then it's much easier to kind of metabolize within kind of, you know, your parameters of your daily work. And I know Putin's a really terrible example, but you see when he's in a really difficult situation, you can just see him going, yeah, this is why I'm doing this job because it's interesting and it's pushing me and you know, there's a kind of creative opportunity around crises. You know, it's so the famous. You, you have um, your, your, your response, your answer. You have your motivation. It's because you see it as an opportunity and, and the way uh, and he relates to his own motivation, actually, as a leader. So well, and example. leaders, you know, they see crazy. I mean, it's such a trite thing now, but seeing kind of crises as opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. I mean, they're Thank not always, you. are they? I mean, but. Thank you. So years of psychology and uh, Putin. It's not, not very work. <laughs> as, well, to the, build, as a way to build the emotional intelligence. Mm. <laughs> but there, there are other, other tools that are available. And, um, and I'm English, things. though, and we're all emotionally retarded. It's just like it's part of the kind of national psyche, I think. 
<laughs> Speak for yourself, buddy. <laughs> you sound about as English as Kylie. Come on. <laughs> You've got it out of your system. Yeah. What about I'm you, Alex? We've worked together yeah. before. I'm not just being we have. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're just having a banter. Um, yeah. One thing that I do, and it might sound a little bit... Um, uh, a little bit off kilter as well is I actually write scripts when I've got to have difficult conversations and I practice them before just because I know my own abilities and I know that for me if I have something written and I've practiced it um, I, I'm able to manage it much better and the more that I do that the more prepared I am for the next time and the better I get. I find it really really helpful. Mm -hmm. that's another way to model as well to practice it and uh, to see what what could come exactly so that those are all very great tips um, and today we will explore more what we call embodied leadership as a way to develop your emotional intelligence um, coaching is also um, an important tool that you can practice before the crisis um, it's actually because it can really develop trust into your in, in your relationships with your your um, colleagues and employees and then you will have a, a stronger basis when the crisis hits uh, in terms of loyalty uh, from from your team it's also a posture to see the world with new possibilities and as you was you were mentioning uh, james uh, when a crisis hits it's also what are the opportunities about it so seeing the world with new possibilities and putting yourself in this in this um, practice will actually help you seeing that so i'd like to introduce you to um, a coaching tool that you might already already know it's it's called the grow tool and basically it's revising four uh, steps so the goal reality options and way forward in a coaching conversation that you will have with one of your of your colleague, or it can be with yourself as well, when you you you, you write your script, or uh, uh, when you see yourself with um, different leaders, uh, it's about asking, what is it that I want out of this conversation? What is it that I want to achieve in this crisis? What is my goal? Um, and in in there, you can explore a bit more around. Um, with whom do I want to achieve it? How will I know that I have achieved it? Um, when do I think it, it will be achieved? So you can really develop uh, questions here. The art of coaching is the art of questioning, the art of questions. Uh, as a leader, actually, when you, you, you ask questions, uh, powerful questions really can help you um, through any situation. Um, and, and one of the great questions to ask when you enter the, the crisis room in the, the first question you can, you can ask is, uh, what do I need to know? It helps people to really be focused on what they think is important for you to know from their perspective. And that gives you all the information as well. Um, so goal it will be the, the first step. Um, then you, can, you will move to reality. So, okay, now that I've set my goal, and, and I insist it's really important is that you go deeper into your questions, not just, okay, I want to get out of the crisis. Yes, <laughs> uh, who will help me? Uh, when, when do I need them, et cetera. Reality, reality check is um, what, I've, what have I tried already? Uh, what has worked, what has not worked in the past? How close am I to my goal? What is the reality now? Then, you will move to options. Okay, now that I've seen my reality, what can I do? What, what can get me closer to my goals? What options have I not tried? What, what Putin would do in my situation? What, uh, what other leaders would do uh, in, in this situation? Um, who, if you have a mentor, who, what will he do? Or what, uh, you, can, you, can, you can imagine other um, resources that can help you. And then you close the conversation with the way forward. Okay, now that I've identified what are some of my options, what is the tiny step I can do today to already put me in action towards my goal, towards reaching my objective? Who needs to be involved? Um, 
when will I do the first step? So what I would like you to do now, and I'm, uh, that's when we're going to do it, breakout rooms. If you can take um, maybe a, a screenshot of the of the grow tool, it's gonna you're gonna practice in pairs. So one of you is gonna be the coach, one is gonna be the coachee, and you're gonna bring a topic that is related to um, anything you want to discuss, possibly a crisis that you've experienced or you, you are uh, experiencing that you would like some insights. And uh, so the coach will guide you through those different set stages, the different questions. You can come up with your own questions. And you will have uh, 10 minutes each. So 10 minutes, one will be coaching, 10 minutes, the other will be coached, and then you reverse. And what I would like you, when you are the coachee, I would like you to switch positions in the times where you will start asking the, your, your questions as you, and then you will be in the posture of your ideal leader that you've experienced earlier. So earlier you've put yourself in the shoes of Putin or whomever was your ideal leader. You will answer the questions from that perspective as well. So first you will do a round as you, and then second, your coach will drive you again through the grow tool, but in the posture of your ideal leader. Is that clear? Yes. James? I, I was just thinking about Vladimir Putin. Say that again. So the second time. So if you are, let's say you are coaching me, uh, oh. and uh, so you will ask me the questions. Uh, goal, reality, options, way forwards. So I'll mm. answer them. And it's fine if you cannot go, you because you have 10 minutes, you might not be able to do the entire cycle. You might just be the goal or just the reality. That's fine. But during 10 minutes, as a coach, uh, you will guide me through those, those four quadrants. And um, after you've started, I've responded, the second round, I will do it from the posture of my ideal leader. So I will do it uh, from the posture of, I don't know, Mandela, for instance, if it's my ideal leader. I'll put myself in his shoes. Is it clear? Yes? Um, it's strange, but clearer. <laughs> I know it's strange, embodied leadership is not something that is uh, um, necessarily um, practiced a lot, but we'll see later um, the, the output of it and, and let's see how, what it brings to you. Okay? I have a question regarding the time. Yes, Julian. Is the 10 minutes for uh, four rounds? So two rounds as coach e and two rounds as, two rounds as coach or, or is it 10 minutes per person? So there would be like five or coach five for the first uh, for us yes. five for as <laughs> your uh... exactly thank you julia so it's five minutes for you respond as yourself five minutes you respond as your ideal leader then you switch five minutes uh yourself five minutes your ideal leader okay so it will be important as well for the coach to watch time if you're not able in five minutes to do the entire circle, that's fine. Just stop where you are. If you stop in options or in goal, that's fine. Okay? Yeah. All right. So, Anna, can I help? <laughs> so, I think, is everyone back? Uh, yeah. I think uh, we'll, we didn't lose. No, we lost Alex. No. Yeah, we lost Alex. We have lost Alex. She was with me a second ago. So. <laughs> I know she's, uh, she's back. back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, we we are coming to to the end of our webinar together. I'm really curious before we 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 bring it to an end to uh, listen to you and basically ask you what what have you learned in this exercise that you've just practiced, and what is your main takeaway from uh, from the conversation this morning? I found the coaching session quite um, useful. I was the coachee, for example, and 
we, we didn't really get time to do more than that. So we had one person, Alex, coaching. I was the coachee. And, you know, through her questions, it really enabled me to, to look at my challenge from many different angles. It was really quite useful. Um, we struggled, I think, to understand how to embody um, the, you know, the inspirational leader that we had chosen I think we need a bit more guidance on how to do that so I, I don't think we did too well there and just from the course overall I really liked the um the table that you put up where you gave examples of do's and don'ts on that cycle the crisis uh, leadership cycle I thought that was very practical and, and, and very easy to use in terms of here's your table how does that relate to my past experience or how would that relate to what we might need to do moving forward? So yeah, some of the highlights from my perspective. Thank you, Giles. Um, I enjoyed the last exercise, but it's mainly because Julie is an excellent listener and was very perceptive and about three minutes, but it, it, this was useful for me because I mean, no, no model's perfect, but it's actually kind of a good way to think about having a conversation like this. So I think that was a useful structure. Thank you, James. Julia, would you like to share a bit from your experience? Yeah, I think that the embodying the, the leader is a, is a difficult, um, I think especially if you have um, a leader that is more removed from you, like I think it would be different if you sort of think of like, I don't know, like my last boss or like a parent or a friend or someone that you actually know very well, it may be easier to try to think, okay, what would they do or how would they react? Whereas when you pick a sort of like world leader or like someone famous or like someone that you just don't have, you know, that you're always looking from the outside in and like you wouldn't have even seen necessarily how they dealt with like truly, you know, like, you know, you were not in the room when they were dealing with the crisis, right? Um, I think that's a lot harder uh, to do. I think it's more helpful perhaps for the first exercise that we did, the sort of like try to get in their body and like, feel what they were feeling or like their posture or something like that. But I think for them, something like this exercise, I found it a lot harder. Mm -hmm. One of the first um, points that we came to is like, well, I think I would have a much broader like network of people that I could tap into to deal with this problem, you know, um, which I obviously don't have. Um, so yeah, I, I found that uh, challenging, but again, it was very uh, interesting to talk to James about the like we actually got the rail slightly, <laughs> perhaps, but uh, yeah, it was very interesting. Thank you, Julia. And uh, yeah, it's not easy to, to work through embodied leadership. Um, you'll see when uh, Anna will, will share the presentation, um, there are four main uh, body dispositions that are explained. That will be uh, your, your friend practice after the webinar for you to embody them. So there is a description of how you put yourself in this posture. And I would encourage you to then have a look at your coaching goal that you just discussed today from those four postures and see what different answers come from those different um, postures. And from what I'm hearing, Julia, even if you did, if you found it difficult to, to be in the posture, you realize oh, what I need is a wider network. So that is already in itself um, uh, guidance maybe to, to look at into like how can I widen my, my network um, but thank you so much for, for being willing to play this uh, together and uh, just to conclude really uh, crisis management and crisis leadership is in particular is really about how we are able to see uh, um, a problem or how we see the crisis will define how will we respond to it, how we are emotionally intelligent will be uh, really important. And what you have experienced through these two rounds of role uh, is there are two ways of looking at a crisis. One, if you want to, to have a result and you're not achieving that result, you can have a first order of learning here that is, I'm going to change my actions. And that's usually when you look on your own typical way of doing, uh, the, it's, and it's, it's good. You, you can change actions and see different results. There, there can be limitations. And the limitations are you here at the observer who, of you, who you are. Every day, our body is printed with experiences of life. And we record in our brain, in our body, 
um, how we react to a certain experience. And the more we experience it, the more likely we are automatically engaging our body and our response, our behaviors toward that first print. So even when you look at the first order of learning, our actions will be impacted of that because it's difficult to take a different perspective. And so that's when the second order of learning comes in. And that's when you are putting yourself in the shoes of some, someone else or in, uh, in different body dispositions, because then you're able to experiment your, uh, your challenge or your objective through a different emotion, a different mood, or, or also you will see other uh, opportunities that are uh, available to you. And that's where actually you are able to grow your emotional intelligence. So the more you will practice that, the more you will be able to tune in a wider range of actions, your, your, your scope of possibilities and of action as a leader will widen up. And so in order to practice, I strongly encourage you to, to, to put in place this exercise where you will see the those four body dispositions here. I'll let you discover it because we are running out of time, but there is the stability posture and then you have a description of it. Openness, resolute and flexible. And through these far four different uh, elements, you will be able to notice um, what is available to me in terms of what I say, what I think when I'm flexible and when I'm resolute. Uh, what is my mood? What, what is my body? Uh, what does it say to me? And that will already uh, be a first step in developing your, your embodied leadership and your emotional in intelligence. I remain available if you would like further information. And uh, I really, really thank you for your participation today and for your, uh, your engagement to, to be this leader um, willing to go through the crisis and, and um, be present to it. So thank, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward thank to- Thank you very much. Yeah, Th thanks Kami. It was really, really interesting perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll follow up uh, then further with sharing the, the presentation. And um, of course, feel free to continue conversation with uh, Kami on a bilateral uh, basis. Thank you very much for everybody. Yeah. Thank James, you have something else to add? Or the, the, that's a, that's no, it. no. It's, so it's the broccoli crisis. <laughs> I, so it's, I, I resolved that. It was done within the first 10 minutes. Bye, everyone. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.